Finally, I have a pleasure to introduce Dr. Otruba, uh, a recipient of RISC Junior Research Fellowship. Uh, this fellowship is supported with the grant from the US Department of Education. Uh, Dr. Otruba is a feminist political geographer, conflict resolution practitioner, and anti-trafficking advocate. After completing her PhD in geography at Rutgers University, she began teaching in the sociology and anthropology department at Moravian University in uh, Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Her research focuses on the violent and certain geographies of conflict affected populations in Georgia. She also uses uh, ecofeminist and post decolonial theory to study political ecologies of slow violence and power asymmetries with, uh, within more than human contact zones. Um, please join me in, in a round of virtual applause of, uh, and welcome Dr. Uh, Dr. Otruba. Uh, floor is yours. Uh, you can start your, <laughs> your presentation. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you for the invitation to present my ongoing research with you today. This presentation, A Political Ecology of Emotion and Displacement in Georgia's Abandoned Soviet Spas, is part of a project supported by the American Research Institute of the South Caucus Junior Research Fellowship. Thank you, ERISC and the US Department of Education for your generous support. I also want to extend my gratitude to Dr. Nino who is in the audience today for the vital work that she's doing to contribute um, and coordinate with research participants in Skultubo this oh. summer. Um, <clears throat> because of travel restrictions, uh, the project would not be possible without Nino's vital help. Um, finally, my most important thanks goes to all of my research participants for allowing me to walk with you to bear witness to your intimate experiences and for the trust that you have given me to amplify your stories in order uh, to meaningfully reach a wider audience. Uh, before beginning, I'd like to preface this talk by explaining that the project remains very much a work in progress. Since I'm in the middle of collecting data, I'll mostly be emphasizing the design of this project with the intention of providing a follow-up talk where I can offer my broader findings after having a chance to carefully analyze the data and have a chance for my participants to decide how they wanna use their photos, which are uh, essential to the methodology. On the eve of Orthodox Christmas 2020 in the Republic of Georgia, I joined friends from Samagrello on a day trip to Kutaisi. On the way, my friend stopped his blue Dodge Caliber in Skultubo so we could enjoy some dark tourism and exploit the neoclassical architecture of this former Soviet venaleological spa town. Graffiti, trash, decay, ephemera from decades past, old medical records, crumbling concrete, broken tile and garbage wrapped in winding tangles of brush made these semi-abandoned sanatoria look like sets from an, a post-apocalyptic film. Our discomfort began to grow as signs of life emerged from these ruins. Satellite dishes clinging to exterior walls, laundry hanging from uh, rotting balconies, smoke pouring from the makeshift exhaust pipe served as stark reminders that these gigantic monoliths operate as collective centers for internally displaced persons from the contested region of Abkhazia. My friend, who is a journalist, made some polite inquiries with residents and arranged permission for us to explore the Stalin era metallurgy sanatorium. Despite permission to view the interior architecture of the building, we could not help but feel that the snap, snap, snap of our cameras was a violation of the private lives of this marginalized community. A feminist curiosity in the precarious conditions of the sanatorium prompted me to consider the long-term implications for protracted displacement in these decaying structures. What harm had resulted from poor access to basic electricity, heating, plumbing, or from the experience of time? How had the uncertainty of displacement and the precarious environment of decay shaped agency and futurity? 
Upon seeing fences cordoning off some of the properties in anticipation of being transformed into modern hotels, resorts, and casinos, I also wondered how plans for economic redevelopment might also be threatening to dispossess this conflict-affected population once more. This research centers on the struggles of IDPs in collective centers in Georgia through a critical case study on Skaltubo. It seeks to add to an already existing literature on displacement, collective centers, ruination, and urban planning, some of which has already focused on Skaltubo. And I'd like to mention that some of the folks who've written some of this fabulous research are actually in the audience today. So I credit them for um, the work that they're doing and I, I hope to add to it in, in new and dynamic ways. The way I see myself contributing to this research uh, is by drawing from the emotional and affective turn in political ecology to explore how disrepair and repair of the sanatorium infrastructure shape IDP's emotional experiences. Specifically, I ask how sanatoria inhabitants have come to exist and relate to the material conditions of the buildings and how these ostensibly abandoned spas in turn have influenced IDP's sense of personhood, agency, and time and futurity. In doing so, I hope my findings might help us better understand inhabitants' entanglement with a complex, more than human assemblage of power relations between other humans, radiocarbonate water, crumbling concrete, mold, fecal matter, insects, and other non-human material actions. Feminist ethnographic method and photo voice, a type of community-based participatory action research, which uses photo elicitation, are being used as ways in this research to explore this political ecology of decay, emotion, and displacement. My hope in the end is that this project furthers the impetus to improve living conditions for IDPs and contributes to the work of feminist geographers and other political ecologists who are working to bring attention to the gendered, intimate, and power-laden embodiments of environmental and social justice conflicts in post-socialist Eurasia. The Republic of Georgia is distinguished by its richness and diversity of hydro hydrological and mineral resources. Hundreds, if not more, mineral springs have been identified, each presenting different physical and chemical characteristics with the potential for asset exploitation. These mineral waters are essential for commercial production and the appeal of balneal climatic resort towns such as Sayerme and Bordromi and Skoltubo. Enter any supermarket in Tbilisi and you'll discover many of these brands lining the coolers. In 2014, mineral water was fifth in the list of most exported Georgian products. The commodity is so culturally and economically significant that the Russians embargoed this product alongside wine in 2006 as a tool of geopolitical leverage before reopening the market in 2013. The commercialization of underground mineral springs, including bottling plants and the investment in the tourism sector around the banaleological resorts are considered a priority for development of the country's economy. Yet only a limited number of these rich mineral resources are used for commercial and recreational purposes at this time. Skaltubo is one such target for this development. The Skoltubo municipality in the Imereti region of Georgia is known for the curative nature of radon carbonate mineral springs. During the Soviet era, Skoltubo and its 22 sanatoriums attracted thousands of Soviet citizens under Article 119 of the 1936 Constitution, which guaranteed citizens to the right to rest and leisure. Finalial therapy via the intentional exposure uh, to radon was used to treat a range of diseases from eczema to infertility. However, documentation of the efficacies of this type of therapy are debated widely in the literature in a range of contexts spanning from Georgia, across Eurasia, and from Iceland to North America.
Yet the dissolution of the Soviet Union in 1991 forced many of the sanatoria to close their doors. However, they did not remain empty for long. In the wake of the Georgian independence and the war in Abkhazia, an estimated 250,000 ethnic Georgians fled the conflict. About eight to 10,000 were given shelter in Skoltuba's vacant sanatorium. These Georgians believe this accommodation was temporary. As we approach the 30 year mark, displacement has been anything but short term. Gogoshvili and Harris Brandt explained that in 2018, roughly 80% of all IDPs in Georgia have lived in displacement for over two decades. In Skoltubo, this has meant that many old caseload IDPs, meaning those who were displaced in the early 1990s and not those from the 2008 Russo-Georgian War, have never left the sanatorium complexes. Multiple generations have grown up in them. While the Georgian government has relocated some of the IDPs that first settled in Skoltubo, around uh, 1,100 families remain. Um, roughly 40% or 101,000 of all IDPs in Georgia ended up in collective centers like Skoltubo. And this was compared to private housing. Abandoned hotels, schools, former industrial complexes, hospitals, boarding facilities, many of which were not suitable for living, were transformed into shelters uh, for those displaced by the war. These are called collective centers. Um, and they have come to function as distinct neighborhoods in terms of their spatial segregation, isolated away from other residential areas and central parts of the cities and they've become tight community networks. <clears throat> um, Bogoshvili and Harris France uses the concept of neighborhood effects from urban studies to frame the physical and social isolation that these IDP settlements uh, have experienced and how these conditions have contributed to making them one of the most disadvantaged groups in society today. While the experience of IDP populations in Georgia is not homogenous, the existing literature does recognize some general concerns for IDP's risk for long-term poverty, high variability in sources of income, unemployment, poor labor out market outcomes, isolation and exclusion from broader social networking, subpar housing, poor access to education, and a range of mental and physical health problems. Trauma and stress caused by the precarities of social dislocation for IDPs has also been widely studied by a range of different um, scholars, including my own advisor, uh, Joanna Rogalska. While many of these issues are not unique to IDPs, IDPs are nonetheless worse off compared to other populations in vulnerable situations in Georgia. They experience a greater sense of abandonment despite always being subject to constant intervention by the government and international organizations. As a result, they have become disenfranchised by a shifting terrain of bureaucracy and what um, Dunn calls ad hocracy, rights and social services. Some have argued that these gradual acts of inaction, systematized apathy and affective geopolitics have even helped sustain IDP structural vulnerability. Several important critiques of Georgian IDP policy have discussed the belief that integration would weaken Georgia's geopolitical claims associated with return. Among the contributing factors to IDP marginalization and these neighborhood effects, tenure and lack of adequate living conditions remains one of the most important concerns for old IDPs and collective centers. Like other IDPs and collective centers, Skoltubo IDPs live a life in disrepair as sanatorium infrastructure crumbles under the weight of time. To survive in these precarious conditions, IDPs have been forced to construct their own makeshift means of survival by augmenting the buildings gradually over time. This, to borrow Tamsa uh, Kalvashi's concept, infrastructure of brokenness and repair, is central to my project that I'm doing this summer. On top of this, this group of IDP continues to experience tenure insecurity. For years, IDP status in Georgia disallowed them from buying land on pain of losing IDP status. 
Only beginning in 2009 did privatization of some collective centers take place. Moreover, IDPs continue to live under the threat of further displacement and eviction, um, meaning involuntary resettlement from forced government relocation to new collective centers, as has happened in the past in places like Batumi, Gustavi, and Tbilisi, when local or national level government had interest in privatizing or developing the sites of the collective centers. Under this history of involuntary resettlement is a, understanding this history of involuntary resettlement is essential to the case study of Soltubo. In the past two years, plans to revitalize Soltubo and transform it into the spa capital of Eastern Europe uh, has come with the growth of tourism in Georgia. Over the last decade, the municipality has been granted millions of dollars in funding from the World Bank for public projects. The Skultubo Spa Resort was refurbished, then reopened in 2011, and now operates as a privately owned four-star hotel and convention center. In addition, operating sanatorium hotels include Hotel Prometheus, Hotel Nicola, Hotel Central, as well as other smaller short-term rental properties. Despite this investment and overhaul to the town's public center, this progress has really, quote, failed to usher in any significant de developments, according to Appy. Then in October, 2019, Kadzina Ivanishvili, a wealthy oligarch and highly influential political figure in Georgia, declared his intentions to buy and refurbish Soltubo state-owned hotels and nine thermal baths. He has even promised to build new housing for the IDPs still living inside the soon to be renovated uh, sanatorium. The chairman of the Georgian Dream Party, whose wealth is estimated at roughly $5 billion, explained, quote, since the state does not have the resources to invest several hundred million in the full scale rehabilitation of Skultubo, and there is no development plan for the resort, I have decided to manage the Skultubo rehabilitation project personally, end quote. Claiming to not seek any profit, Ivanishvili vowed to transfer ownership of Skultubo sanatoriums to, quote, any investor at any stage, unquote, of their reconstruction if they could match the money he spends on restoration, even at a significant dip, uh, discount. The project aims to promote sustainable economic growth and attract 15 to 20,000 new employees to the Imereti region. Ivanishvili's development vision and concept of the Skultubo Resort is based on a plan by a Swiss consultation company, Colin Partners, which envis envisages an arrangement of children's playgrounds, water parks and pools, restaurants and other businesses, along with the revitalization of the sanatorium. Leah Suladze's article, uh, A Monocrat's Hobby and Its Power on Shadow Politics in Georgia, uh, I believe this was presented at a works in progress not that long ago, um, looks at Ivanish Bili's Dendrology Park and Panorama Tbilisi. And I believe that this article in particular provides a helpful framework for thinking about Ivanish Bili as an informal actor or monocrat and the shadow politics that are possibly operating behind this plan to revitalize Skultubo. While some have celebrated the charity and social entrepreneurship of Ivanishvili, others have acted with great alarm. Opponents see the process of alienation of public resources and transferal of the properties to Ivanishvili at a symbolic price of less than one lari as a form of racketeering. The Open Society Foundation of Georgia released a statement saying, quote, we respond to the media report about the large scale alienation of the buildings and spaces in Skultubo City and considering it inadmissible to privatize the resources important to the society in the stated form, unquote. Critics call this a land grab since much of the portfolio has been valued at many millions of dollars. Such monopolization leaves Skultubo open to abuses of power and prohibits the control of public access to this cultural heritage. Open society argues that it is, quote, unacceptable that the state had not developed a strategic plan for the development and privatization of property and public resources. They write, 
quote, such an approach creates a sense of ineffectiveness of the state, diminishes the importance of the state institutions and promotes cases of unreasonable and thoughtless scale sale of the state property, unquote. The signatories of this letter argue that an investigation must be conducted on how the city um, region or the state will benefit from this project. This process has excluded the wider public from the right to environment in the city. Absent from much of this coverage is how these development plans might impact IDPs in particular. Since 2007, the Georgian government's policy on IDPs has focused on their long-term integration and the development of durable housing solutions. As the summer of 2020, uh, the Municipal Development Fund of the Regional oh, Ministry of Regional Development and Infrastructure has completed the construction of two residential buildings for IDPs just outside of Saltubo Municipality. This is part of a six point plan. The two completed residential buildings were designed to house 140 IDP families. A plan for constructing six additional residential buildings in Saltubo is underway at a cost of more than 33 million uh, lari. Representatives from the Municipal Development Fund claim that this will provide homes for an additional 560 IDP families and will be completed by 2021. <laughs> uh, yet IDPs are skeptical about these plans for new housing. The uh, testimony of one IDP that I read, um, he explained, we keep being promised new apartments, but nothing happens. The only time the government shows any interest in us is when they want our vote. Um, in my other research on the borderization of South Ossetia, I often heard similar things from other conflict affected uh, populations. Although I admit that these per the perspectives are quite diverse in the literature. The failures of IDP uh, resettlement are often represented uh, in the 2004 eviction of IDPs from two large derelict hotels in Tbilisi, which were redeveloped into for-profit hotels and a casino. Although IDPs were offered up uh, to $10,000, uh, the amount was insufficient to continue living in Tbilisi. IDPs were effectively displaced again, according to Aaron Koch. Um, the Georgian government has consistently fallen short of its relocation goals. Even among those who have been relocated, um, the author aptly shows that many choose even to return to Svaltubo after discovering that the conditions in their new locations are often worse still, for instance, because of lack of gardens uh, for growing their own food. Furthermore, some displaced persons hope that the potential increase in tourist activity in Svaltubo might present employment opportunities in construction or service roles. Uh, yet there is little mention of the long-term involvement of kind of displaced persons in the labor market. Um, in this plan. Therefore, uh, I think a lot of us are really interested in seeing greater attention being paid to privatization and capitalism's kind of ravenous appetite for surplus accumulation uh, and kind of looking at the outcomes of who this will leave in its wake. So the literature on displacement in Georgia has strongly demonstrated how IDPs uh, continue to remain liminally incorporated and socially isolated within Georgian society. Authors such as Koch, uh, Braun, Babos, El Abed uh, show how the category of IDP itself symbolizes this idea of a life out of place. When I began framing this project, I found the literature on slow violence to be particularly productive for its way to conceptualize how displacement temporarily disperses the war's capacity to harm repeatedly. Um, Nixon describes this concept as a gradually unfolding catastrophe, quote, a violence that occurs gradually and out of sight, a violence of delayed destruction that is dispersed across time and space, an attritional violence that is typically not viewed as violence at all. As a spatio-temporal concept, slow violence demands our attention to forms of harm that, quote, have over time become unmoored from their original causes, according to Davies. 
using this understanding, my project asked how the decay of infrastructure constitutes this kind of slow infrastructural violence to use uh, the concept from Rogers and O'Neill. Like other scholars, I aim to extend and complicate conceptualizations of slow violence by examining inhabitants' experiences of living in the abandoned sanatorium buildings, but by being attuned to the important work that emotions do in producing these spaces, specifically how feelings of marginality and peripherality, or conversely, as I heard in an interview this week, empowerment, are produced through one's intimate entanglement with the infrastructure of brokenness and repair. As Farhana Sultana argues, emotions matter in resource struggles. Like other scholars interested in the productive aspects of ruination, I'm also interested in finding out if and how the threat of redevelopment and the idea of repair may act as a medium, if not an active agent of social change going forward. So how do you design a study that achieves the goals empirically and ethically while avoiding the reproduction of what some call ruin form? To empirically capture the phenomenological experience of an elongated time horizon and disrepair's impact on personhood, dignity, and fertility, I'm using feminist research methods. In political geography, feminist scholars use embodied approaches and situated perspectives to show how sensation comes to matter, to challenge uneven power relations, to decolonize hegemonic knowledge production, and to promote justice for marginalized groups. In this project, I'm using visual ethnographic fieldwork methods, which are methods supported by authors such as Davies and Warburg, who argue that it is advantageous for studying the drawn out and complex timescapes of slow violence. This ethnographic study will combine participant observation and qualitative semi structured interviews with photo voice as a principal method of data collection. Photo voice is a community based photographic participatory research method. I selected this method as a response to the visceral ethical discomfort with power asymmetry that I have routinely felt in my research encounters in Georgia as a Western outsider working with conflict affected populations. This was the same discomfort that I described to you at the start of the presentation. I also see this methodological choice as an intervention to IDP's perceptions toward tourists uh, and ruined foreign photographers who visit the abandoned buildings in the in the thousands every year. Uh, commenting on the presence of Taurus, I read um, one account of an IDP in Saltubo who explained to journalists that they, Taurus, do nothing for us but invade our privacy. Snap, snap, snap with their cameras five times in a day. As a feminist scholar of conflict research, the question of how to study human suffering and violence without re reproducing harm or turning it into a spectacle has been really a central ethical question in my research, which I continue to grapple with on a daily basis. Using more participatory methods and uh, quite literally flipping the camera around to put it in the hands of research subjects is one important intervention that I've included in this project as a way to help keep the study centered on grounded experiences of those human and non-human who inhabit the sanatoria and which can also be used by participants should they choose as a tool for social change. Photo voice is described in the literature as a key tool to facilitate a grassroots approach to understanding communities and a social process of critical consciousness uh, designed after um, kind of this idea of pedagogy of the oppressed. As it applies here, photo voice is being used to render IDP experience with slow violence more visible and call attention to the needs of this conflict affected population. The technique of photo elicitation empowers participants to visually capture their individual perspectives uh, and experiences with cameras as part of the research process. Participants in the study will be asked to photograph scenes that highlight their lived experience, showing details such as 
the material conditions of the spas and their impact, resilience, survival, and adaptation to these conditions, and any changes to the landscape because of the redevelopment of the spas. Photo Voice offers a tool of empowerment which amplifies voices of those in positions of limited power to tell their story of marginality, injustice, or even exploitation. Because this is a collaborative method, it helps participants share in the co-generation of knowledge, exercise autonomy and authorship over representations, over their stories and perspectives, and it provides a meaningful platform for participants to advocate for social change in the face of their peripheralization. Although I'll be interviewing a range of actors and stakeholders over the course of this project, the primary group of research subjects recruited are these photo voice participants. And this is going to include about 15 to 20 adult internally displaced persons who currently inhabit uh, the sanatoria in Spaltubo. Although the project aims for gender parity in our sample, um, civil society participation in Georgia is disproportionately comprised of women. So we've already seen a greater interest by women, though we're hoping that our sample will become more diverse as we go along. Um, photo voice participants are broken into small groups of no more than five. And so far, all interviews have been conducted in Georgian. Each photo voice participant uh, we'll complete four steps in this process. First, we do an initial preliminary interview to learn about the participants' personal history, how they come to inhabit, transform, and relate to the spaces of the sanatoria. Um, these were supposed to be uh, walking interviews. Uh, mobile methods, sometimes referred as go-along interviews, are where the researcher undertakes interviews while walking with their interviewees. This kind of place-based interviewing method, which is advantageous to geographical research that concerns questions about mobility, um, such as displacement, are really uh, important. Although sometimes being critiqued for, for being not scientific, the technique of walking with allows the researcher to engage participants on the move and explore the relationship between what people say and also where they say it. I wanted to do this with participants because it's a helpful tool for uncovering their attitudes and relationship to the material spaces of the sanatorium. Uh, as a type of slow observation and multi-sensory experience, walking methods offers an intimate way to engage with the landscape that can offer, offer privilege and subtler insights into complex meanings of place and spatial knowledge. Unfortunately, COVID-19 and remote research have prevented this part of my methodology. I wanted to mention it nonetheless because I'm hoping that I'll be able to share in this experience at a later time to augment kind of the, the narratives and stories that we've collected. So following the completion of these first initial interviews, participants then go through a photographic storytelling training. In this, the participants learn about basic photography, operating camera, and ethical photography, uh, covering things like when taking a photo might be invading someone's privacy and how to ask for consent to take the photo of someone or their property. At the end of the training, all participants are loaned a Kodak Pix Pro FC43 digital camera, which is a basic point and shoot model. Um, and then following that initial interview uh, and photo training, photo voice participants then are asked to capture photos for the project within a one to two week time frame. After taking their photos, we call the participants back again for an individual photo dialogue. During the meeting, they uh, return their cameras and then they select a series of their top photos for display. At this time, we're asking them to pick five of their top photos. Um, during the interview, they will discuss these five photos, choose a title and write a caption for them, as well as discuss the stories behind the photos and what they mean. Once all members of each photo voice group have finished their individual photo dialogues, then pandemic condition pending, uh, we will bring them all together for a group photo dialogue. Uh, during this session, participants will then share some of their photos with each other 
and have a discussion of common themes and the whole experience. And then at the end, they will develop a plan of action for their photos. Although formal participation in the project ends at this group photo dialogue, we will work to actualize the plans of the group to exhibit the photos over the next year and work towards the participate's vision for social change. Uh, photo Voice has been selected for its synergy with trauma-informed care. Uh, those who are familiar with trauma-informed care understand the importance of the following factors when working with or researching survivors of trauma. This includes physical and emotional safety, um, choice and control in relation to his or her or their participation, collaboration, making decisions together and power sharing, building trust through clarity, consistency, and respect for boundaries, and prioritizing empowerment. So photo voice was selected deliberately as a method of social and personal uh, transformation, but also because it works hand in hand with trauma-informed care. I was drawn to this method because of its potential to rehumanize and provide dignity to subjects who have been otherwise reduced to a label, who have had little choice in receiving care, who have no opportunity to be an active agent or co-generator in studies and the dissemination of many findings. Um, so I'll use PhotoVice to walk with and collaborate with these spa inhabitants to help them decide how they want their photos to be seen and heard. Uh, authors such as my colleague uh, Heather Evans have powerly, powerfully demonstrated the cathartic aspects of PhotoVoice as a method for social justice and personal transformation. Evans, uh, who I work with personally, used PhotoVoice with sex trafficking survivors. Um, and showed firsthand how photography provides an alternative means of expression, which respondents reported minimized the burden of retelling their story. This is important in Skull Tubo because the act of retelling the story of displacement can itself cause a type of harm. Photo voice, however, reduces the need for as much language, breaking down cultural barriers by reflecting a reality as it is seen. By using images that teach, such pictures can influence things like policy decisions, hopefully. Um, this also provides a way of taking back the appropriation of skull tubo by ruined porn photographers and others who um, kind of exploit this crumbling, the image of this crumbling infrastructure. Um, the forerunners of this method recognize how visual arts tend to extract a more powerful response than written word or speech, perhaps because such vivid depictions allow us to recreate that scene which we are observing. Um, risks of discomfort in this method are balanced by the benefits that subjects gain from their participation. Uh, this is a creative form of engagement that provides a learning process on a technical level, as well as on a social level. Um, they are empowered to address root causes of injustice, that um, through their experiences. As such, this research method um, itself is really designed as a kind of ethical intervention to minimize hard harm in research methods um, and kind of promote empowerment in a context of great inequity and violence. As I conclude my talk today, I'd like to invite you to consider joining me again after data collection has finished uh, for this Skull Tubo Photo Voice project. Um, I'd really like the opportunity for my participants to decide how they want to show their photos and um, provide that opportunity for you to kind of briefly enter into their stories um, in a meaningful way. Um, in doing so, I hope you also join me in considering some of the larger research questions that I've posed such as considering the entanglement of this grand Soviet architecture and the precarious interior worlds of those displaced and how this redevelopment might rupture and temporarily rearrange experiences of slow violence. Um, will development act as an instrument of social movement or is this just another chapter in a brutal long array of displacement and forced resettlement? Um, 
thank you so much for being a great audience. Uh, I look forward to your questions and your comments and how they might better help me advance this project um, going forward. Um, thank you, Ariel.